<laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So, uh, where I come from, um, my groups of, uh, we are, um, um, we are working in the, um, the front of our society, which is uh, founded uh, already 1949. Uh, in, it's the European largest um, um, applied research organization uh, with, um, I think, now more than uh, 60 research institutes and uh, more than 23,000 uh, employees. Uh, we have an uh, annual budget uh, around uh, 2 billion euros and our financial uh, model is uh, perhaps a little bit different what you uh, know from the German um, Max Planck Institute. Uh, for two, third, uh, for uh, two fourths uh, we are, have an industrial cooperation and uh, one third uh, public funding and one third is uh, institutional funding. <coughs> So, as you see on this picture, we are in the middle of nowhere. That's <laughs> so, uh, but we have a we have a, a very nice castle. So, uh, I'm working not in this castle, but some of my colleagues. Um, so, um, we are near to uh, the old German capital Bonn. So, I think it's 10 kilometers away, something like that. And uh, we are the uh, largest research center for informatics and applied mathematics in, uh, in Germany. Around uh, 700 employees, uh, they are, uh, they are of, um, 500 scientists and approximately 200 um, students and trainees. So we have strong links to, uh, to the University of Aachen and the University of, uh, of Bonn, where Martin is also a prof uh, professor. Um, in our group, the Department of Bioinformatics at SKY, the um, Scientific Computing and Algorithm Institute, um, we are uh, 10 scientists, uh, three scientific software developers, seven PhD students and five master students and around 10 uh, student workers, um, uh, most coming from, um, from background is computer science, um, several biologists, and of course, of course uh, bioinformaticians. Um, so here briefly an overview of our uh, uh, main activities. So we have a um, quite large group of text mining. Uh, where we uh, extract from um, scientific uh, literature, um, uh, for example, Bell statements, which we which we use in our uh, uh, Bell networks. Uh, you will see later. Um, we have an um, uh, what we call here integrative biology, um, um, a group which creates um, um, disease networks, uh, which uh, allows us to compare, uh, for example, normal disease networks and compute out of this um, interesting new hypothesis. Uh, we are strongly focused on new de degenerative uh, diseases, and um, the third um, uh, is uh, that we have also a group um, working uh, in the grid and cloud computing and high performance computing, uh, which we are using also in our text mining workflows. Um, okay, the, the, the autonomy project. Um, here in brief overview, um, um, our mission in our this project is to uh, increase uh, the knowledge about causes of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease uh, by generating um, an mechanism-based taxonomy. So, um, um, to validate uh, this taxonomy, um, um, uh, to validate this uh, taxonomy, we will have a uh, prospective, prospective clinical trial uh, that demonstrates its suitability for identification um, uh, for identifying patient subgroups based on the discrete uh, disease mechanisms. Um, third, we want to support with our system uh, future drug development and uh, lay the foundation for improved um, uh, identification and treatment of um, um, uh, 
patient subgroups currently classified uh, as having Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease. Um, so this is a, a very simplified uh, uh, picture of our idea. So um, what we see uh, is uh, this GRI uh, patient, uh, but in fact uh, this GRI patient have uh, uh, different causes, uh, mechanistic co uh, causes uh, why he developed uh, a specific disease. And um, if we want to develop a uh, drug for this um, for these patients, uh, we are always dealing with um, uh, different subgroups of patients. And uh, so what we want to see or what we want to understand is a mechanism behind uh, uh, the disease, which allows us then to um, um, clearly uh, um, yeah, um, define um, um, patient subgroup and, um, um, and create better drugs. So um, this is a very high level view of our uh, modular structure in etionomy. So the idea uh, is to uh, create a data cube where we can store um, different kinds of, um, of data like microarray data or imaging <coughs> data or uh, SNP data um, in an n-dimensional space. Um, and um, validate and, uh, this against the models we have created. Um, um, perhaps it's supporting or we have to uh, improve our models uh, depending on the results here. So uh, we created uh, a web application which allows uh, to visualize and um, use several tools we have uh, developed. Um, Later, I will present you in a live demo and, and workflow uh, we have set up. Um, so, and the, the aim of all this is to, to end up with a taxonomy uh, which allows us to um, better define uh, patient subgroups. Okay. Mm, the problem is here, um, as you know, um, we have not for uh, for a patient, all of all these data. So, in an ideal experiment or clinical trial, uh, we would have uh, thousands of uh, patients uh, and uh, many different kinds of um, uh, tests we can make. But uh, usually, this is not the case. So, the underlying concept. So, um, in uh, 2011. Uh, Ismail Kola and John Bell published a paper uh, titled A Call to Reform the Taxonomy of, uh, of Human Disease. And they proposed uh, a new mechanism-based classification system uh, for human diseases. Um, um, this, uh, the current classification of diseases, um, uh, this current classification of diseases is built upon uh, a hierarchical structure uh, with subdivision of morbid entities uh, assigned based on consensus criteria. Uh, the classification uh, is grouped into uh, epidemic diseases, constitutional and general diseases, um, local diseases arranged by anatomical sites, developmental diseases, uh, and injuries. So the origin of the, uh, uh, of the current classification uh, of diseases dates uh, dates back to William Farr, which is already uh, several years uh, ago uh, in 1855. Um, okay, sorry. Um, okay, in this slide, um, you uh, you you see the problem we have. So we have a lot of knowledge. Uh, uh, about uh, the healthy state and. Um, and we have also a lot of knowledge about uh, the disease state of patients. But um, the missing link between this, uh, where is the trigger? Uh, what, is, uh, um, 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 what happens between these both states? Uh, there's uh, very less or, or no knowledge. Uh, and we have to increase uh, this knowledge um, to develop to develop better uh, drugs, uh, especially uh, for uh, early stages of diseases. Uh, 
what drove the concept approach behind the, uh, the project. Um, so uh, it is obvious that uh, a single project like autonomy uh, cannot deliver what decades of uh, researchers uh, have uh, not delivered until now. So uh, yet another uh, biomarker um, uh, fishing expedition is uh, not an option. Um, so besides biomarkers are measurable readouts and do not necessarily represent uh, disease mechanisms. Um, as a consequence, a panel of biomarkers does neither provide the basis of a mechanism-based taxonomy, nor does it provide the full spectrum uh, of mechanistic insights needed for the development of, of new seropoietic approaches. Um, so how does it, uh, how does autonomy re respond to the challenge? Um, so first of all, uh, of course, we want to make usage of all the public and proprietary uh, data and information and knowledge which is out there um, and which we have already uh, integrated uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Transmart uh, version of Etionomy, um, at least for the microarray data uh, which are out there. Um, so uh, the integration of information across scales and levels, for example, um, molecular and clinical, a com combination of knowledge-driven modeling and data-driven mining, and an integration approach that combines a plurality of models and mining strategies. What this means, I will explain later. Uh, and an ad adaptive approach that can easily take up and use new knowledge and new data when they uh, become available. So. Uh, of course also very important. Uh, um, okay, this is perhaps a little bit repeat, sorry. Uh, okay, before Etionomy, uh, already in several projects we, um, um, we developed the things we, we can make now reuse of in our project and um, uh, for example, in a project called New Orleans, uh, uh, we annotated and curated uh, several data like uh, gene expression, microRNA, micro and uh, genetic variance data, and uh, PPI, protein-protein uh, interaction data, uh, and uh, also uh, omics uh, from the scientific literature. Um, and uh, we have... Um, um, we have also uh, access to clinic bi uh, biomaterial collections and patient cohorts. Uh, I don't uh, want to go in detail in this. Okay, and uh, we have created also several um, uh, ontologies, uh, like, uh, for example, the uh, Alzheimer disease ontology and also the Parkinson disease ontology, which allows us to um, to classify uh, our uh, data uh, uh, in, in, in the system, so in a hierarchical system, um, and we can extract also out of this uh, ontologies uh, dictionaries we can use in text mining approaches. Um, this is uh, a, a disease map uh, created by the group of uh, um, uh, the, uh, the LCSP group uh, in Luxembourg, um, the Luxembourg Center for System, System Biology, and I don't know if Reinhard Schneider is here, uh, but I saw him yesterday. Uh, I saw what some of them, their colleagues there over there, and uh, this is a really comprehensive and uh, informative. <laughs> Um, a resource and you can uh, zoom in and zoom out. Uh, it's um, uh, and uh, every um, uh, node and edge in this map is connected to an um, to a literature resource or to a database uh, identifier. Okay. Um, so these are uh, the representation of two um, um, Bell networks um, 
So uh, we are using uh, in, in our approach Bell, um, uh, the Luxembourg group uh, using SBML um, as uh, uh, bil um, building up the network. And uh, in this slide you see um, uh, that we de develop mining strategies um, um, to compare a disease against the normal state. And then we can overlay uh, this on both. Um, of course, this is just a big hair, uh, hair stack, uh, hairball with um, uh, nearly no information if you're not uh, filtering it for or overlay it to, uh, to another uh, uh, network. And that's what we did here. So we uh, uh, we uh, compared this both states and um, um, uh, proposed a candidate disease mechanism. Um, where you see here uh, when uh, in a disease state it's uh, downregulated uh, the way how how the uh, um, how the nodes are uh, connected is different and uh, the outcoming is different. Um, we developed also um, uh, a workflow which we called belief. I don't know the aberration for it. Uh, do you know it? for belief. It's spell extraction of information, ah, whatever. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a workflow we developed to uh, um, extract um, statements out of um, um, scientific literature. Um, and um, um, we are using for that in um, quite old um, software. We but uh, still uh, uh, very good and um, uh, to extract our uh, this statements and um, and writing this to a, at least to a bell document uh, what bell is i you would see in the next slides so okay uh, but um, here shortly uh, you see um, um, that he automatically um, the system automatically recognizes uh, specific gene names uh, and uh, relationships, and you can uh, define uh, in which uh, environment uh, the statement is valid. Okay. So um, here you can see all the data resources we have now integrated in our, in, into our system. So uh, as I mentioned before, ontologies, uh, protein-protein uh, interaction networks, uh, Bell and SBM, SBML models, uh, SNPs, uh, imaging indices, uh, pathways, um, microarray data, and protein domain and families. Um, oops. This one's on. Okay. Uh, now I mentioned several times uh, Bell. So what is Bell? Uh, Bell is aberration for uh, biological expression language, and as uh, every um, language is, has also a, a semantic, a syntax, and um, um, so. You, you're writing a, a complex biological um, um, relationship in a, in a, a standardized um, a form. For, here's an example. Uh, for example, the activity of a specific abundance uh, of a, a biological entity, which uh, have to be defined in a, in a namespace uh, and um, with perhaps with a uh, modification uh, can have a relationship to another ent biological entity. And here's an uh, example how to write this in, in Bell. So HGNC is in, in, in this case the namespace, uh, this human genome nomenclature. And uh, this is a uh, this is an identifier in, in this namespace. And uh, this sign uh, uh, um, indicates that this is an increase of, uh, of uh, this, the abundance of this protein uh, with this modification. So PMOD means a protein modification, uh, with, which is a, here a, a phosphorylation. Okay, so this sentences, this complex sentences is then translated to this. So um, the question is why we are using Bell and not something different. So um, the reason is uh, because it's uh, 
it makes several things simpler. <laughs> so especially for for biologists, biologists, if they want to translate um, their statements in, into a formalized language, then uh, uh, you can learn uh, well in s several hours or at least days. Um, so every um, Bell statement is defined in a, sp a specific set. We call it set. It's an environment, for example, and uh, could be in tissue or in uh, a cell type. Um, and uh, every statement have an, um, have an, is linked to an evidence. So in, in, um, usually in, in PubMed reference and uh, with, uh, with a extracted sentence where you find uh, this statement. Okay, um, so uh, a big part of my work during the last uh, months or nearly one and a half year uh, was to prepare the data for, for the system. So the problem is that um, nearly all uh, um, data resources uh, have different um, uh, different types of formats, and so that means, if, as I think uh, everybody knows, that uh, extract, transform, and load is a is a is a hard job also in in Transmart, and um, so uh, we wrote several thousands of code to make this uh, possible, um, but we also um, we are in the moment we are not. We are all using an own parser and compiler uh, because we have some uh, requirements which were not possible to solve uh, with uh, the Bell compiler. Um, technically, we are um, we are uh, using Python, mostly Python, which uh, in in a in a web framework called Django. Um, this has a clear uh, structure of uh, model view and control. Um, which uh, allows you also to uh, easily, um, for example, uh, um, provide uh, RESTful APIs um, to your partners. Um, okay. Uh, and everything is um, stored in a, in a MySQL database. Uh, but we are now um, make some experiments with uh, Neo4j. Um, um, perhaps you know Neo4j is perhaps the standard of um, uh, graph databases. Uh, they provide an, uh, a language called Cypher. Uh, this is very similar to SQL and allows you to uh, write very sophisticated uh, queries which is not so easy in SQL or other um, mm, uh, other graph libraries we are using. Okay, um, on our website you will see in some seconds uh, you, uh, we have implemented uh, a, a browse, the possibility to browse in the data. Uh, we have a, an administration, um, we have uh, implemented administration tools uh, you can uh, show uh, the data structures uh, and uh, we'll get um, simple statistics uh, on the data. Um, okay. Um, in autonomy, uh, we have uh, now uh, created one of our first workflows where, where we tr uh, try to make use uh, out of the uh, Transmart data, um, and um, in Transmart we uh, calculate the different differential expression uh, of uh, genes um, by comparing normal against uh, diseased patients, and with this list of um, um, differential expressed genes, we filter our Bell network and. Uh, 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 filtering our Bell network for a sub-network. And with this sub-network, we try to identify um, um, identify tissues and brain regions which were not described here or not uh, extracted from this tissue, perhaps, where the data coming from. 
the other part is the other branch of this um, um, of this workflow is that we um, um, search for all identified uh, nodes in our network, uh, the chemicals which have interactions to these genes. Um, uh, these genes, um, uh, these uh, chemicals, uh, we test them if they are already uh, described as a drug in, uh, for, uh, in drug bank. And that's not implemented now, but we will uh, also um, provide it in some days. Uh, and uh, we'll also look up if there's uh, uh, if a clinical trial already exists. So, okay, uh, as you s will see in some seconds, um, this is a uh, publication uh, in Review, in, nat in Nature Reviews, uh, Neuroscience, uh, already published 2006, but um, um, the, the result of our, uh, of our um, workflow um, nicely um, represents what you can see in this uh, picture. Um, so the uh, neurogenesis of dopamine uh, and uh, the genes which are contributing to this. Okay, uh, here is now the same workflow, a little bit simplified, but that uh, makes it perhaps easier for you to remember uh, these icons. So this is an icon for Transmart, I think you re recognize it. And uh, here is for, for our bell. So we are, again, we are uh, analyzing with differential expression analysis um, um, the significant genes. Then we uh, subselect the nodes in our bell network. Then we identify new, um, um, mm, uh, uh, new brain regions and uh, tissues, which could play also a role in this context. Um, with uh, genes, uh, significant genes, we are searching uh, all um, biological networks and ranks them by uh, the highest, uh, highest number of genes contributing to a specific uh, biological pathway. And then we are searching for uh, uh, chemicals in CTD and um, uh, look up if there is already a, a drug described in drug bank. Okay, I think this is familiar to everybody of you uh, because uh, this is a, a, a part of, uh, of etonomy uh, where you can uh, use in this uh, navigation panel uh, your experiment, select um, a normal or a diseased uh, patient group and getting uh, um, statistics for this uh, comparison and you can um, use um, um, in the section analyze, you can use the marker selection and then uh, create the results which I use in, uh, in the workflow. Okay, here is uh, something uh, from our uh, partners. Uh, they make it possible to uh, use this data in their um, disease map I presented some minutes ago. And uh, all the uh, over or under expressed genes are marked in this map. Okay, live demo. Okay, this is always dangerous. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is a website. Uh, so you find it um, under Etonomy Sky. Dot .fhg dot .de, so it's free, it's, you don't have to log in or something like that. Only some data are, are blocked because of privacy. Um, on the left side, uh, you have an overview of all these domains I've described before. Um, and, uh, for example, uh, here for uh, the Bell disease models, uh, you always get an and brief overview uh, statistics, uh, what's behind this data. And uh, what's also important for software developers, of course, uh, is uh, uh, the database structure. Uh, so we published it for, for all of these uh, data resources we are using. Oops, go back. Ah, this was a new. Okay, and you can uh, also browse in the data. 
So if you are interested in specific uh, uh, data, um, um, then we can provide you a RESTful API um, to, um, to access this data. In the moment, uh, we have, uh, I think, more than 500 tables and 700 million uh, entities in our uh, rows, in our database. So, uh, we have we should know what 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 you are interested in and then we can provide it to you okay um, so uh, I already mentioned uh, ontologies um, uh, here you can find the link to uh, our transmart uh, uh, implementation Oops, open. No, sorry, sky. Ah, this is uh, not working. Uh, data. Clinical data, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I have to log in as guest at guest, and it works. So if you want uh, to test it. Uh, um, here you can find the, di the disease maps I described before. Um, and here is an example uh, of a Parkinson disease model. And uh, as I mentioned before, every um, 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 every statement is defined in a specific set. So uh, I clicked here like an, an, uh, a neuron, a specific neuron, or let's try something else. And uh, you can zoom in this data and now seeing uh, uh, the, the statements and the, uh, uh, the edges uh, with a sign which shows you here that this is an uh, biological entity. Okay. Um, good. Okay. So uh, hopefully you remember this diagram I presented some slides ago, and um, this is now the result of the um, of this um, uh, workflow. Um, so we are uh, comparing uh, disease against uh, normal, and uh, here is a, in this table you find um, uh, all significant genes uh, with a specific. Uh, uh, or uh, with a threshold below 0 0.05 for bon Bonferroni value. And um, so on the right side, you see the fold change and uh, the name. And But you see here also uh, if it's uh, identified in our Bell network or not. Uh, so and the direction of the, uh, of the change. So and I now uh, the colors should be changed. Uh, red is up regulation. Green is down regulation. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, with this list of significant genes, we now uh, search in all available uh, wiki pathways and identified uh, the pathways uh, uh, with the highest uh, overlap. And in this case, I think it makes sense in the in the context of uh, of Parkinson. Um, uh, here you see um, the, the filtering of our Bell networks. All colored nodes uh, are now um, the nodes which uh, represent the significant genes from the differential expression analysis. Uh, all the gray nodes uh, and links between this are calculated by shortest paths. Uh, and we added all uh, also the the neighbors around this uh, significant genes. So if you are clicking on uh, on an edge, as I said, oops, not what's wrong? Uh, ah, here. Uh, okay, uh, as I said, every um, relation, uh, every edge in our uh, network is uh, is uh, linked to an evidence. And uh, which is, you see here on the right side. So and um, yeah, here are some explanations of uh, how to read this. And okay, um, 
go, going back to this list of wiki pathways, and uh, on the right side we have here in an, an, an link uh, um, uh, to the next part of our of our workflow, and this is the identification of chemical interaction with uh, the selected genes. At the top, uh, you see uh, the genes uh, <coughs> which we identified in this pathway, and uh, now we are uh, we are searching for all chemicals with which have an interaction on uh, on these genes. So we rank them by the um, so this chemical, for example has uh, the uh, uh, four inter uh, or interactions to all four genes and uh, uh, but the lowest number of interactions to all other genes. So the idea is, or this very simple idea is that uh, we want uh, to find chemicals which have exactly the opposite effect uh, of uh, what we uh, can observe in, in the disease state. So. Uh, and uh, the lowest side effects to other genes. Um, but, but here we list uh, uh, every, um, uh, every chemical and uh, often you can see in the list also uh, that you have um, uh, the interaction of this chemical to these genes could be in both directions. So um, if you are interested in more details, you can go here and uh, every, every single um, interaction is described or go directly to uh, CTD where the link uh, to the uh, publication is here. If you then automatically PubMed is open and you can read the articles to this. And uh, here is the definition. Uh, you can find the de definition in comparative to toxigenomics database. Um, and if this is already described as an uh, as a as a drug, uh, you find here a link um, to uh, drug bank and uh, the drug bank, uh, uh, the description of the indication. Okay, how many time? Oh, I'm <laughs> I'm late. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, it's nearly okay. Um, so uh, in our project, so we uh, are using uh, two different approaches to um, to develop a hypothesis. One, uh, as you uh, saw and I described, uh, is to de develop disease models and um, um, uh, by analyzing these disease models. Um, creating new hypotheses. Uh, the other uh, branch is here um, using uh, clinical data and an uh, unbiased clustering and bring to, uh, at the end together both um, to, um, uh, yeah, uh, to validate and uh, test this against a um, patient cohort. Uh, so this is the last slide Martin provided me and uh, so uh, Sorry, why do we need uh, model-driven uh, mining? Uh, it, it enhances uh, uh, data mining and um, um, data interpretation cap capabilities, uh, establishing, uh, establishing uh, um, co computable uh, knowledge layer representing indications, disease syndromes, uh, any sort of pathobiology. And of course, reasoning over functional context is now possible. Um, we are using also uh, MZIC, uh, which allows us to clustering statements in groups, like you saw before, we uh, did it in, uh, in stats. Um, and um, this last uh, item here, uh, based on a paper, I think uh, published also by you, <laughs> this is a, a, a reverse causal reasoning uh, with Natalie Catlett and uh, uh, in Dexter Pratt, um, and this shows the possibility to um, to use um, a Bell network and validate this against the data um, to perhaps support or um, perhaps yeah improve your model and uh, test it against uh, uh, against uh, uh, the knowledge which is already out there. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much.
is good. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. That's that's excellent. Uh, it's it's great to see how you know technologies like Open Bill and Transmark can come together. And for me personally, having worked on both, it's uh, it's quite gratifying to see that. Um, are there any questions uh, for Christian quickly? Yeah. Yes, Gary. I feel like Bob Barker. Come on down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, intriguing presentation. I'm, I'm still trying to position this uh, solution for the problems I encounter in real life. Mm. And um, so, to me, it gives the impression that it is somewhere between uh, an ontology, between a way of defining relations between concepts, and and a pathway analysis tool. Mm -hmm. Uh, or perhaps um, um, OpenBell is, is a solution for all three of them, but um, it, it still also puzzles me a little bit how they then is positioned compared to, uh, to alternatives, like, uh, well, we're still struggling in translational research to get people adopt on ontologies, and there are already a lot of existing ontologies, and even they don't get adopted, so why would this one get adopted? Um, that's one question, and the second question uh, to stick with those two then would be how, in terms of relations, uh, does this initiative compare, for instance, to um, what the Concept Web Alliance is doing and, and the concept of using triplets, if you're familiar with that one. Yeah, yeah. in fact, um, OpenBell uh, is nothing else than, uh, than a collection of triplets, so it's um, in building up a network, but uh, the big advantage of uh, OpenBell is that uh, it's, um, it collects all the knowledge and you can validate your data against uh, this network and can easily, uh, per, for example, overlay two uh, different uh, OpenBell networks to compute something out of it. And uh, the usage of, um, of uh, ontology uh, in this context is uh, to um, yeah, classify um, the data we are, um, we are integrating together with our Bell network in autonomy. This answers the question or not really? Let me, let me add, add a piece of because because Garrett, I think one of the questions people ask is, what are practical applications? How does this make my life different? And I think what OpenBell does that other technologies uh, for network representation don't is it's a computable network representation. What does that mean? That means that the network has enough embedded information that you can apply an algorithm to it and it can interpret the network. Uh, most network representations where you're just storing triples and whatnot uh, obfuscate the relationships between the nodes. They're human interpretable because we know if we see a kinase that that is a protein-protein interaction that results in a phosphorylation. But the computer doesn't know that. Uh, Bell makes that uh, specific. Um, but how that can be used is that you can then apply an algorithm that takes a set of data and then infers the states of internal nodes. So that's what Whistle does, is uh, you can take that. And what's an application of that? In fact, if you go back probably about eight years ago, uh, we did some work with David Stransky at Hopkins where we could take uh, gene expression profiles of tumor versus normal tissue and you could go back and predict the states of different kinases and whatnot in signaling networks. And that could be used to drive uh, therapeutic decision making. So when you couldn't directly see you know, the activation of a particular kinase, uh, you could see the downstream effects and the gene expression changes that then having the right Bell network, you could reverse, uh, reverse causal reason on that and predict those internal states. So there's lots of interesting applications. Once you start working with a computable network representation that has everything you need in it to do reasoning, uh, there's lots of things you can do with it. Sure, you had a question? Yeah, actually, I'll, now I have two questions. <laughs> so the first question, I should just follow up for you. Um, in terms of looking at the data and then from the data, you can infer sort of the state of you know, different nodes and, and um, biological and entities. The question I have is, I mean, because that really depends on the data you have, right? Because in the, the, the in the case of say the kinase that you just mentioned, you you really have to measure the right time points to to get that data because the phosphorylation um, state. No, 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 I think so. No, I, mean, I, I guess how how many trigger designs that we were. So just one of the interesting things is when you try to measure things. Let's just take TGF beta as a good example, right? TGF beta, you know, you can only see it for about 30 seconds or less than 30 minutes. 
you don't see the message, you don't see the protein, but you see the effects of TGF beta. And so when you're measuring downstream events like gene expression, is because that network was activated for a short period of time, you see those echoes. And then by doing, taking that gene expression and doing a reverse causal reasoning, it'll predict that state, even though the state is not measurable itself. Got it. Um, a question I have is on the on the text mining aspect. Actually, mm. I was wondering um, how good is you know the, the text mining right now in in um, getting the protein protein interaction network and, and molecular interaction mm. information out of text mining because yeah. I think the regular text mining is pretty hard already and, and um, yeah. So in uh, so the workflow, the belief workflow I presented, uh, in fact, is not a complete automatic workflow. It's a semi-automatic workflow. He suggests you to, um, to uh, um, he identifies automatically uh, the, the, the entities in the relationship between it, and then you can uh, click yes or no. And uh, so otherwise, it's it's not precise enough. Um, about the belief also. So in about that, what? Uh, the belief project, extracting the yeah. knowledge. Uh, I had one question. I was wondering, um, do you do it totally automatically or you still do manual curation after that? Is no, there's, there's still manual curation. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so as he suggests you the, the, mm -hmm. the, the relationship between oh. two entities and then you have to uh, say yes or no. Okay. Uh, do you know how well does it extract long distance relationship if you have how uh, well yeah you have one you have a gene in one sentence and then relationship like three sentences below. yeah this is of course this is a big problem in text mining in general so um, if you have uh, in high distances relationships uh, so the human language is very complex and not so easy to uh, analyze by text mining this of course is a big problem Okay, I have a question on the reverse causal reasoning. So reverse causal reasoning is sits on the top of the knowledge base where gene expression was measured when a protein was somewhat um, manipulated. Yeah? And uh, when you do the reverse causal reasoning, of course, you take all of the genes that you know are being affected by the manipulation of that particular protein. That includes something that was measured 30 minutes after this gene was knocked down or overexpressed. It was also includes something that was measured in a knockout animal that was born that way. So how this kind of plays out? How do you really separate the immediate effect and uh, the long-term effect, temporal? Uh, that's, next, that's an excellent question, and I think. We'll just answer this one, then we'll move on. But um, when you're doing reverse causal reasoning, the, the challenge to it is is your reasoning is only as good as your knowledge base. And uh, when you're trying to take uh, data that's from many different sources, many different publications, it's from the published literature, uh, when you can finally do this kind of work, you realize how incomplete that is and then how biased it is. And then we have the challenge that we've seen, which is much of the data that's published is actually not reproducible as well. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges. Once you have this kind of technology and capability, you really look at now how, how do you build the, the right quality of knowledge base to effectively deploy that tool. And I, I think that's a challenge that people are still working on. I don't, did you want to say anything about that, Chris? Okay. Thank you very much. I think it was a great talk. Um, now I'd like to invite, I think Andy is here, Andy Hill. Oh, there we go. Andy's going to, uh, as one of our sponsors, Thomson Reuters, which does a lot of work in this area uh, in terms of uh, doing curation uh, of content and whatnot. And I believe, Andy, you guys are doing some work with Open Bell as well. Um, you give us a, a quick uh, introduction here. Uh, and then uh, what we'll do is after Andy's uh, talk, we'll break into two groups, uh, one going to the technology session, the other staying here for the datathon, uh, and keep moving, working through uh, that. So, and a reminder, uh, after we break up um, in the technology session, there won't be a coffee break, so you'll work through, but coffee will be brought in uh, in the middle of your session. Uh, in the Datathon session, we will have a break for coffee. Okay? Are you all set up there, Andy? Yeah. Well, I'll say just two more seconds. Um, I, I, I like the, the timing of, of Andy's discussion here is quite good because we're going to talk next about the cross-neurodegenerative disease Datathon 
uh, which was held uh, at Thomson Reuters office in uh, in Boston, uh, and now also co-sponsored by Thomson, uh, and also was leveraging uh, a project which they did uh, working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So, Andy. Yes. Thanks, Keith. Good morning, everybody. Um, I flew in yesterday, and I know some of you probably either flew in a similar time or the day before. So my watch currently says it's 4 a.m. So my voice sounds a bit deeper than usual. You can understand why. Um, Good morning. Thanks for having us at this at this event, and we're very pleased to be a contributing sponsor, as as always. And I just think back to two years ago when we were in. Yes. <laughs> uh, we think back to two years ago when we were a very small group at University of Michigan, and how far you've come. And thanks to your leadership, Keith, and keeping this train rolling. So it's very interesting. We're talking about Open Bell and uh, quality of networks and things like that. So it will sort of play into a little bit what I'm going to talk about. I'll be sensitive to your time, though. I've been allotted five minutes, so I'm going to take no more than uh, more than that time, ideally. Um, I'd like to say a few words about Suramon. Suramon has just come back from maternity leave. She had a, a baby boy about uh, ten weeks ago, I think. She sends her best to everybody and wishes she could be here, but just having given birth, she obviously has other priorities at the moment. But she looks forward to being able to participate very actively, as she once did. Right, and let's see which way you do this. Am I pressing the right button, Alex? Is it the right one, right hand one? Ah, there we go. Okay, so very quickly, I'd like just like to uh, acquaint you with the kinds of things Thomson Reuters is doing, if you're not aware of those, and how the kinds of things that we do can help add value to the dr drug discovery process, and in particular in the context of applying those learnings and capabilities around the Transmart platform, which we've been involved with since its inception at Janssen all those years back when Eric Praxis was still at Janssen. Um, and I, I think we can help in several different ways. One is around the area of NGS analysis. Um, we'll talk a little bit in a moment about network analysis. It's very timely that uh, our speaker before me was talking about this type of thing as well. And just innovation in general, the types of things we're doing with people like Michael J. Fox. So as we all know, the cost of sequencing a human genome has plummeted and got to the $1,000 per genome sort of price point that the industry was hoping we'd get to, which is great on one hand. The cost of doing that sort of experiment is, is dropped. But it presents another challenge in how, you, how do you manage all this data you're creating? And many of you are creating very large amounts of data with, with running these sorts of NGS experiments in your, in your research. Which then leads us to the, this, the great debate about annotation and interpretation of these genomes, this genomic information. So once you've sequenced your genome um, and you've identified various variants in that, you want to be able to understand what things that variant is doing. Is it contributing to the disease? Is it a known drug target? Um, etc. and anything else shown on this slide. And, and ultimately then, how can you combine that with gene expression data to, to make sense of what is a viable drug target and where intervention may be possible? So, Thomson Reuters has been curating a, a manual curated database of gene variant information, gene disease, gene treatment associations. It's, uh, I'll be very, disclaimer, it's very heavily oncology focused at the moment. Um, we'll be starting a, an effort in rare diseases in the near future, but in terms of oncology-based content that's out there right now, it's as robust as, as you will find. And uh, the, the quality is there. It's, uh, it's being used in sort of precision medicine type applications where it's actually being, the information is being used to assist oncologists in, in diagnosis from uh, somatic testing. So we're in the process of implementing this uh, through, in the form of a plug-in through Transmart. And that can also be combined with genomic analysis tools, which you have available in the MetaCore platform, that can take a large number, of v large number of variants in a VCF file and use various filtering techniques to get those down to a smaller, more manageable number that you can then bring in or will be able to bring into Transmart. Which leads us on to the next topic about axiomics analysis. So the previous speaker talked a lot about gathering certain types of data, multi-omics types of ex experiments. And we then get on to the, the subject of trusted knowledge base. Oops, I'm sorry. Wrong, wrong thing. Trusted knowledge base. 
So Thomson Reuters has been curating this meta-based knowledge base for well over 14 years. It's all manually curated information. Currently, it's about 300 tables in this database with about 1.6 million protein-protein interactions current count. And for performing things like reverse causal reasoning, one needs directionality, and all the interaction information in this uh, database has such directionality, which lends itself to doing that. So what one, one can do is to use a series of network algorithms. We'll talk about the CBDD thing in a minute. Is use a series of network algorithms to combine this type of data for applications such as determining mechanisms of, of action, uh, stratifying patients to understand why some patients are responding to treatments and why some are not. The CBDD, uh, some of you may be aware of this, some of you may be not. This is an effort which Thomson Reuters established about uh, just over two years ago. It's now a, a pre-competitive consortium effort made up of these member companies. And our effort and our aim with here was to determine and implement a series of algorithms that would be suitable for network analysis. As you maybe know, there are large numbers of algorithms being published on a regular basis in the literature. And it was through initial conversation with one of the companies on this list of our members here that we, we hit on this idea of the CBDD project. And that is to help customers prioritize what algorithms we should implement for what purpose. Now that we're at the stage of having a little over 20 something network algorithms already implemented and they're delivered as R scripts to our members, which means they can be used on the back end of Transmart for doing more advanced analysis once you've selected your cohorts and so forth. Then we're at the stage of now looking at benchmarking some of these algorithms uh, to compare what algorithms and what use cases they can be used for. Because that's something our customers told us is something else they struggle with. It's fine to have an algorithm published for one particular thing. How, how wide a use case can you really use it for? Um, this is a paper published recently with one of our members, uh, very, very translational medicine focused. Um, it is a, 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 a study we did with them which is using cell line data, where we use modeling methods to try and predict whether drugs are going to be sensitive or resistant in, in, a, in a given patient setting. Transmart was also used in this paper as well, so that's one reason I included this publication. And this was in June of this year in POS1. And lastly, um, you heard some of this yesterday, I believe, but uh, this, is, this is an active project we have with Michael J. Fox Foundation right now, where we're incorporating um, streaming of wearable uh, data from wearable sort of sensors and, in, and using that in, in, a, in an analysis setting. I'm not going to say too much on this at the moment, but this is a, an innovation which we're, which we're working on with uh, Michael J. Fox. I said I'd keep it brief. So, can all the Thomson Reuters people in the room please stand up and show yourselves? Okay. So as you can see, we're well represented here today, and I encourage you to, to network with my colleagues, understand what they do and how we can, we can potentially help you in your pursuits to improve the quality of patient care through translational research. Um, we are a Fortune 500 company, so we have the size and scale and longevity to be around. Um, we're curating things on a high quality basis, all manually curated, and we provide access to this technology and content in different ways, such as APIs, uh, database formats, etc. We also have the expertise to help you implement these projects and do analysis of such projects. We've done probably around 30 Transmart implementations as a company and over 50 bioinformatics type analysis projects ranging from biomarker identification, patient stratification, drug target identification, and now a lot of, reposition, a lot of repositioning type of work as well. And I cite here two instances recently where in the last two years we've received uh, BioIT World Awards uh, last year with Berenger Ingelheim for the work we did with the group in Ridgefield on the BI Smart Platform, and this year with Michael J. Fox. That's me. Well, one of the nice things, Andy, is I think that you feel like I'm not talking is I've got we're partners, but I'm also 